Well, good morning. And Dr. Liebman, thanks so much for that uh, introduction. And I have to say that uh, there are a couple of things that uh, uh, impressed me about today. And one thing is that I think we have over 600 uh, people that have registered, and I think at least we know that there are over 300. So it's incredible to be speaking to such a wide audience, and it's uh, just a thrill to be here. The talk that I'm going to say is about functional neurosurgery and the brain-machine interface. And I have to say that what Dr. Binning showed us was absolutely extraordinary and incredible. When I was a resident, uh, those sort of things were probably unheard of, and we would probably more often than not create problems in patients and trying to fix them. So vascular neurosurgery is absolutely uh, night and day from where it was you know, during my training. But in all fairness, I think that the field of functional neurosurgery is really a gem. And I think that this is where the brain is going to become a tool of investigation, a tool for empowerment, and a tool for innovation. And I think that many of you are probably already hearing about that. This slide is a little bit tongue in cheek. It says, pardon me, is that a neuroprosthetic you're wearing? And that's because I think that many of you may already realize that there are companies like um, Neuralink, uh, BrainGate, or Kernel, that are trying to popularize the notion of tapping in to the human brain and utilizing its functionality. Here at uh, Global Neuroscience Institute, I do a bunch of things. Uh, uh, the most important thing I think today is to be on time. And so I'm going to just move through my slides. Here's a picture of me almost 20 years ago. And it's when I was at the Mayo Clinic. And the picture is not to be nostalgic to remind myself of what I looked like when I had hair, but it's really uh, to let you know that I joined the neurosurgery residency at Mayo in 1998. In 1997, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, allowed for on-label use of deep brain stimulation. So for the first time, we were widely starting to interrogate the brain, put electrodes in the brain, and creating solutions to brain problems. And this was really absolutely innovative and revolutionary. So I really enjoy the fact that throughout my training, this has been something that's been a part of me. I've been at a lot of places like uh, the University of Miami, Ohio State, uh, but now I'm absolutely proud and happy to be at Global Neuroscience. I'm happy that we have and excited for our Philadelphia Neurological Institute and proud to be a part of Drexel as well. Neurosurgery is something that I find amazing. So ever since we first started coming together, the time period is called the Neolithic, as communities, neurosurgery of some sort has been performed. And I won't uh, uh, bore you with too much of my wow, but on the left side of this screen, there's a skull, and it's got two holes drilled into it. For us today, that's really not a big deal. We have tools and instruments to access the brain through the skull, and that's very reasonable. But 7,000 years ago, that must have been extraordinary. And what the reason was for doing that, who knows, but that is our ancestry, and that's what we inherit as we move forward as neurosurgeons. And it wasn't just in Europe where uh, Einstein is. The middle picture is from uh, Lima, the Larco Museum, if you're ever there. You'll see that there's this also a hole made in somebody's head, and that patient actually survived. And not only is it where we're doing things with the brain, but the brain is always, and the skull have been a fascination. Just below that skull is the first description of brain in any kind of written language. That's the Egyptian hieroglyphic for brain with the eagle. The last slide shows you um, uh, a skull uh, picture that I took uh, at the uh, Palacio Nacional in Mexico City. It's an artful decoration of the skull. We certainly don't do that. Um, uh, but it just shows again that the brain and the skull and the human CNS have always been a fascination for man. Equally, I'd like to show you what we do at Global Neuroscience. And one thing that we do is not just operate. I mean, we are phenomenal surgeons. We provide impeccable care to our families and our patients, but we also do research. And I have to say, I've been at a lot of places 
all academic. And this is one of the most academic places that I've been. And I can't begin to say enough about my friends, colleagues, and research uh, collaborators, because that's what we've been able to do. There's a program that we do through our Drexel colleagues called TRACES. And TRACES stands for Translational Research and Core Expert Support. Fundamentally, when I'm doing an operation in the uh, OR, there is a PhD that's literally 10 feet away from me collecting tissue that would otherwise go to waste. And one of our great, great, great discoveries is that we can actually take brain tissue and we can support it for up to three or four weeks. And that's what this slide or the image on the right hand side shows. This is a slice of a human brain kept alive for three weeks. And you can see the neurons, you can see their beautiful uh, uh, arborization and branching pattern. And this is insane. And this is amazing. And this means that not only are we operating on people, but we're finding ways to ask questions about individual neurons outside of the brain in an environment that never would have been possible. So we are all about excellent clinical care, absolutely, but we're also all about research. I think this next slide is also a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, anyone that's uh, younger than 20 and listening may not know about The Matrix, but that film was very revolutionary. We're going to be talking about neuroprosthetics and neuroprosthetics or uh, neuroprosthetics, it's a discipline. And fundamentally it relates neuroscience and engineering and product design to develop a prosthesis or an artificial device that's either going to replace or improve functions of the nervous system. And broadly speaking, there is going to be a flow. The brain will talk, the prosthetic will listen, and then there'll be a delivery. People that are trying to do that are folks like Elon Musk and Brian Johnson. And I'm going to play a little video because um, it's a sound clip actually from The Matrix. Some of you might remember that uh, the Keanu Reeves character was literally kind of hooked up to uh, something and then suddenly he exclaims, I know Kung Fu. He exclaims, I know Kung Fu. Surely. And while that would be amazing, that reality is far from here. And in fact, that's what folks at Neuralink, Elon Musk and Brian Johnson at Kernel are trying to do. And I think there's a little bit of a dissonance between what they're hoping to do and what can actually happen. And that's what I'd like to show you, what we're doing today and what we know that we can do in the future. One thing I'd like everyone to appreciate is that the brain is insanely complex. And saying that is not to be trivial or trite, but it's really to lay the groundwork. The picture on the left shows what I think a lot of people think the brain is, a circuit board where there's a um, point A that can be retrieved by point B. And that is, I think, what you get the sense of if you ever watch The Matrix or if you ever watch Elon Musk talk about Neuralink or if you ever talk, uh, hear Brian Johnson talk about uh, his project, Kernel, it's decoding the brain. But I think that the picture on the right-hand side is really the more relevant picture. Our memories, our brains, they work in a way like as if you were to take a picture, rip it up into a thousand pieces, throw it out there, and then try to reconstruct the picture. It's not perfect, it's not electronic, even though the brain is an electronic system, but that's the fuzziness in what we do and what we uh, experience clinically. And it's overcoming that fuzziness and understanding the brain at a much more closer level that is critical to moving forward with the advancements that I'll talk to you about. Now about 40 years ago, uh, even more I guess now, it's almost 70 years ago, before we could interrogate the brain, what we actually did was make lesions in the brain and see if we could help by disrupting what were felt to be abnormal pathways or connections. This next slide is one that has a lot on it and it's worth talking about. So the guy at the top left has a long name, but effectively it's Ega Muniz. And he was a neurologist in Portugal and he, for my vascular colleagues, they'll probably know this, actually developed 
cerebral angiography. So those uh, images that uh, Dr. Binning showed you, they were started by Dr. Moniz. But what you may not know about him is that he got the Nobel Prize, not for vascular angiography, but for frontal leucotomy, fundamentally psychosurgery. Dr. Moniz was a neurologist and he needed a neurosurgeon, so he found the fellow on the bottom of that slide, uh, Almeida Lima, and they started doing a series of experiments. And they operated on 20 folks. And uh, it's curious to me that why Dr. Moniz did not include Dr. Lima on the, on the paper, but prefrontal leucotomy and the treatment of mental disorders. I think it's worth just reading a couple lines. And in that abstract, he says, in this exposition, I do not wish to make any comments since the facts speak for themselves. Well, in fact, they don't. These were hospitalized patients who were well-studied and well-followed, which they were not. The recoveries have been maintained, which is not true. And I cannot believe that the recoveries can be explained upon simple coincidence, which is also not true. Here he says, prefrontal leucotomy is a simple operation, which is true, always safe, again, not true, which may prove to be effective as a surgical treatment in certain cases of mental disorders. Again, not really true. But what that did overseas lit a fire in the two guys on this uh, lower right-hand panel, Walter Freeman and James Watts. Again, it was a neurologist, Walter Freeman, that employed James Watts to really start to almost evangelically use leucotomy. And what they did was ultimately create what was called the ice pick lobotomy. Walter Freeman actually took the term and created the term lobotomy. And what he would do is because James Watts, the surgeon, became a little bit apprehensive or probably a lot apprehensive about what was going on and Freeman then figured out a way to do these operations without a surgeon, without anesthesia, and just almost as a traveling evangelist. So he was so evangelical and so zealous in his capacity that he did this thing called the ice pick lobotomy, where literally you would take an ice pick, put it up against the orbit of the eye, crack through the orbit, and then turn this back and forth. And he claimed that this was a magical, amazing treatment. And you might say, well, that's crazy. Who the hell is going to do that? Or who will submit themselves to that? Well, guess what? People. For instance, Rosemary Kennedy. So her dad took her to see Freeman against anyone in the family's understanding or knowledge. And Rose was apparently getting a little bit impulsive and aggressive. Freeman diagnosed her right away and did an operation at that moment and they declared that it was a success. Rose went off to a convent for care. The only downside was that she was totally unable to care for herself. As a matter of fact, she couldn't even speak. And the Special Olympics is something that Maria, uh, or Eunice Shriver, actually established in part in behalf of her sister. So you have people that have means that are submitting their families to this kind of psychosurgery. But it really wasn't until popular culture, in particular Ken Casey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, that people started to ask the question, are we really doing the right thing? And so that's where I would say we have to be very careful and that's where we are, as neurosurgeons, want to advance the field in a very precise and defined manner. So for instance, what can we do in the brain? We're trying to do less destructive things and we're trying to do more augmentative things. I think that's entirely in keeping with what Dr. Binning was showing you. Here, for instance, is a picture of somebody that has epilepsy. There's an electrode in this inset, in this MRI on the left, that has little contacts. And those contacts are things that both I and my neurology colleagues can listen to and look for seizure activity. And if we find it, we can go to that spot of the brain, usually it's an area called the hippocampus, and I can find the electrode and I can take out the seizure focus. Mm -hmm. That's amazing, and these people go on to have incredible lives that are seizure-free, but again, that is a destructive therapy. 
And I think what we are realizing as neurosurgeons, we can actually modulate and modify brain signals. Now, that's not an ancient concept, or that's not a new concept. Uh, the Egyptians, who had such an incredible understanding of the brain and of the body, actually knew that if they took the Nile catfish and they held it in their hand and they got the stinging from the barbels, that somebody with arthritis would actually have temporary relief. So a neuroprosthetic, we're not putting catfish in your head. We're not putting barbels uh, and making you hold a catfish. But what we are doing is this sort of cartoon image of an electrode going in the brain connected to a, what we call a pulse generator battery, almost like a, say, a pacemaker. It's really that simple. What's not simple is knowing where to place your electrode. And that takes a team. And for instance, we're really uh, absolutely fortunate at Global Neuroscience and in the hospitals that we operate at that we have put together expert teams to know where in the brain we're supposed to stimulate. It takes an army of folks and we lead that army. And for instance, we don't only just use imaging and say, hey, I think we're going to put an electrode here in the brain, but we listen to the brain. And that's the real important thing. Much like if you were to travel the globe, if you're uh, somewhere in China, you'll hear Chinese. And if you're somewhere in Germany, you'll hear German. Various parts of the brain have various signals that sound very distinct. Like for instance, in this area of the brain, you can hear this bursting kind of sound. And I hope you can, I hope that the uh, audio is coming through. Now, in another area of the brain, you can hear this sound that's a little bit staticky. Well, it's probably all staticky if you're just listening to it for the first time, but it has a very different character. So you know, again, just like language, our geography in the brain has a different language associated with it. And then finally, when we get really, really close to where I think we're gonna solve the problem, you'll hear this almost machine gun type of rattle. Now, if you hear this last part, you'll hear there's almost like this um, sort of oscillation. And that's the oscillation that drives a tremor. And when we're in that spot, I know that we are absolutely going to give our patient an incredible outcome. And I'm not going to spend too much time with this slide, and it should have some audio Talk with it. This, uh, but here's a patient in, um, that we operated area, on. And this fellow was kind enough to let us uh, film the operation. My partner here is holding his hands, not out of compassion, although uh, he is a very compassionate guy, but our patient's arms would be just flying all over the place if it weren't for the fact that somebody was helping contain him. You'll see him try to write, and you'll realize that this person can't even do his daily activities of living, can't take care of himself because of the violence of his tremor. And so, I'm very fortunate here at Global Neuroscience to have a neuroscience colleague, Dr. Jill Farmer, who helps me evaluate these kind of patients and allows us to stop their tremors. So we're working in this uh, fellow's right brain. Pretty soon we're gonna turn on some electricity and we're gonna see that that tremor goes away. And for the first time in 10 years, this guy's able to do what he wants to do. And you'll see, he's gonna be calling his wife, holding a phone, which he was never able to do because it would always fly out of his hand. These are things that are so amazing because I think that these are the patients we help so incredibly. And you can see over here, here's how the electrodes look. So I'm gonna just skip through this in the interest of time to get to our next slide and show you we're doing even more with neuromodulation. And one of the things that we're doing is, this is a slide that shows you a patient that has a problem that's in their brain that's creating seizures. But the seizures are coming from an area that would control their right hand. So nobody wants me to cut out that part of the brain to stop their seizures. They want to maintain their functionality but stop their seizures. The device that you're seeing here that's overlaid on the skull and overlaid on the image of the brain is called a neuropace. It's literally a brain pacemaker. The device sits on the brain, it analyzes the seizure activity, and then it sends a signal to stop the seizure activity. Somebody who otherwise would have been hopeless and helpless is now cured. Again, we can do really, really, really nuanced uh, investigations. I can put electrodes just about anywhere in the brain safely, and I can figure out where seizures, well, along with my neurology colleagues, where seizures are coming from. 
Again, not just cutting out brain, but using electrodes to identify what parts of the brain are seizing. Are seizing. And if those parts of the brain are eloquent and important, then we're not gonna take them out. And we knew that the part of the brain here in the left temporal lobe was eloquent, meaning that it was important for language, memory, and, uh, and speech. And so we weren't gonna take that out. And again, this NeuroPACE device shows that we put two electrodes in and we've stopped his seizures. So these are some of the most amazing things that I can imagine doing. And uh, one thing that we can do here is that these patients now have these, this is a neuroprosthetic. This is a cyborg. This is a kid, and this is a kid, that basically has a walking, talking EEG all the time that is helping him through life and reclaiming his life. It's about the most thrilling and uh, incredible thing that we have to offer as neurosurgeons. I think it's one of my favorite surgeries. Now let's wrap up because we are wrapping up. And I think that in all fairness, in order to understand the brain, I have this slide up and it might be a little bit trivial, but it says that in order to understand the brain, we have to know what the brain is. Well, we know that it's billions of cells with quadrillions of connections, but understanding that activity and those neurocircuits and how they give rise to cognitive processes like thinking and writing and consciousness are really not understood. And it's going to take major technological breakthroughs. Well, where are those breakthroughs going to happen? Uh, I, well, they're already happening. And there are places in the world that are pushing the envelope of what is called functional neurosurgery. So the 21st century for what I call neurorestorative surgery or functional neurosurgery is already in place. I went to China, and as a matter of fact, it was my last trip before COVID happened. And in China, they are doing deep brain stimulation or functional surgery for a variety of conditions that include depression, cluster headache, eating disorders, either bulimia or anorexia, Alzheimer's disease, pain, addiction, and even minimal conscious state. And the fact that they're pushing this envelope is pretty incredible. And we hope with really, really stringent understanding to move forward and start doing some of these things. So what's the reality? You have Elon Musk on the left and you have Brian Johnson in the middle and on the right. Uh, Elon Musk wants us to believe that he's going to be able to implant a chip in everybody. He wants us to believe that it's going to be robotically driven. Brian Johnson wants to show us that he has zero body fat, but that he's wearing this kind of helmet that is going to decode brain images. And I think while it is a little bit crazy and there are poo-pooers of this, they are on the right track. If you put $100 million into something, that's more than any research institution or university. They're going to find something. I think ignoring these two guys is the wrong thing. I think partnering with them, and as a matter of fact, Dr. Vez and I had a meeting once a while back partnering and talking to these folks or uh, uh, to the Colonel folks, uh, that's Brian Johnson's group, and we're really excited about trying to do something here because I think what they lack a little bit is the clinical uh, sort of direction. The image on the bottom is from the Wall Street Journal. And I think people are worried, and it's okay to be worried. And in, uh, as neurosurgeons, knowing what we did with psychosurgery, I think that's fine. The worry here is that we're going to start commodifying your thoughts. They're going to be accessible, they're going to be uh, uh, appropriated, and that you will no longer be the owner of your thoughts. And I understand that fear, especially given the fact that we had some of the remnants of psychosurgery that still make people quite scared. This is, I, I, I was a, uh, a classic scholar until my dad told me I couldn't be. Um, so uh, this is from Homer in the Odyssey. There's a part where um, Homer really is apprehensive about progress and he knows progress comes at a cost. So for Odysseus to get back to Syrac uh, for to get back home, he's going to have to navigate these straits between Scylla and Charybdis. Scylla is a six-headed monster, and Charybdis is this whirlpool that will take the whole ship. So I think that what I'm just trying to say without being facetious is that 21st century neurosurgery and neurorestorative surgery will require strict ethical guidelines, technological innovation, and progressive minimalism. And as long as we stick to that, we'll get the thumbs up from our patients and we'll move forward. Thank you, everyone.
That was wonderful, Adam. Thank you so much. Before we go on with questions, I just want to do a shout out to our Lord's Medical Center colleagues who commented <clears throat> that they miss us and specifically <laughs> miss Dr. Binning. So we miss you guys too. Um, Dr. Sarkar, you know, you've talked about, it was fantastic, the innovation that is now available and that you are performing. How do you know which target, for example, if you're doing vocal cord tremor, what do you target? Yeah, so uh, that comes with, uh, we stand obviously always on the shoulder of giants. And uh, it, the brain is just like any other thing. It's location, location, location. We have a lot of understanding that there's a particular target. If you want to get geeky, it's called the thalamus. And in particular, it's called the VIM thalamus. We just did a, a vocal tremor patient the other day. We're able to target that spot explicitly. The patients are awake in the operating room like this slide shows, and we're able to actually show that we can mitigate their problems. And so we're really absolutely excited about this. Um, I was told, uh, Dr. Liebman, that I had to innovate, I had to take care of patients, and I had to be on time. So I think I'm on time. <laughs> you fulfilled all the criteria. Well, outstanding. Again, it was just a wonderful talk. And it just, it, your mind just, it, it's endless in terms Absolutely. of what we can do with the stimulation. And, and I think your point is excellent in that we tried to move away from, we've had to move away from ablative and now right. more stimulative. What about functional imaging? Do you think functional imaging is going to take away the need for, for example, WADA testing or other types of testing that we need? So uh, that's a really excellent question. And that's actually what Kernel is doing. So Kernel is doing something where they have something called flux and flow. Uh, the flow is exactly like uh, what uh, you as a vascular neurosurgeon would be curious about. They're trying to measure blood flow to parts of the brain and trying to decode what that blood flow incorporates. And then flux is looking at magnetic signals, magnetic encephalography. And so I think that those are real two uh, innovations. And again, we're far from where we need to be, but if we don't start, we're not going to get there. And I think to your point, Dr. Liebman, doing that is going to start making some things obsolete and it's going to take us to the next level of functional imaging. And any thoughts on or information around functional ultrasound? So that's an interesting concept, and I think it's one of those things where uh, some things that's old is new again. And ultrasound seems like it's so safe. You know, women have it to uh, uh, to you know monitor gestation. Uh, it's like wow, it's it's in the office. There's nothing scary about it. But functional ultra ultrasound effectively does something. It uses energy. Ultrasound is energy, and it ablates. And I would think that we are getting away from that. I think I'd like to, uh, I think I've hopefully shown you that the power of neurosurgery is pr um, preserving tissue and not destroying tissue. And while we're surgeons and we love to operate, we know how to operate around the brain, the less we can do more precisely, the better off we'll do. So I don't, I don't poo poo functional ultrasound. It's just another tool. It's another uh, product, but I don't think it's the future. Great, thank you again. Uh, as everybody we've mentioned and we reminded, please fulfill or fill out your evaluations at the end so you can get your continual education. And as you can see from the agenda, we have a half an hour break, break, excuse me. Please, please, please go to the exhibits to visit our industry partners. As Dr. Vez mentioned, as we're all mentioning, yeah. the importance of industry, they have helped us move our field of neurosciences in a supersonic fashion and with their partners will continue to move this field. So please, please, please visit our exhibitors. Thank you. Great, thank you everyone. Bye-bye.